So I, um, I know that's a t this is a ton of information um, all at once, and I have quite a bit more, sorry. Um, but um, I, I'm supposed to talk to you about the alternatives to hormones um, and then a little bit about sexual dysfunction um, at the end. Um, and one of the things that uh, I want to talk about first is risk. Uh, there's risk to everything in life. Um, you're all old enough to know that. Um, when you drove here or walked here, you took some risks. Uh, when you eat something, you take some risks. Um, medications are the same way. Um, every medication you take has some risks, hopefully some benefits, um, and it's only worth taking a medication that's giving you more benefits than you're taking in risks. Um, unfortunately, for most of us, we don't necessarily know what the risks and benefits are going to be when we start a medication. There is a leap of faith that we're going to get some benefits. We don't always get those benefits. Um, there's a leap of faith that we won't get the biggest risks, but that's a leap of faith. So keep that in mind when we talk about all of these medications. There's no perfect answer. Um, but on to all the options. There's a lot of options out there, um, and some of them are good and some of them are not so good, but we'll talk about it. So the first option is uh, placebo and doing nothing. So believe it or not, hot flushes get better. So people who take placebo 20 to 40% of the time get better. And some of that's psychological. It feels good to be doing something about your hot flushes, even if it's not necessarily changing anything. You feel good that you're doing something. Um, and some of it is just that hot flushes will get better. Uh, so one option is just to do nothing, live with it. It really depends on how much the symptoms are bothering you. Um, if they're keeping you up at night, if they're starting to interfere with your relationships, it's probably time to start thinking about options for treatment. And then we have three options that are better than placebo. Not as good as hormones, but better than placebo. Um, and that's the antidepressants, gabapentin, and clonidine. Uh, Antidepressants, uh, which are SSRIs and SNRIs, um, Effexor and Paxil are the most common ones we use, are effective 60% of the time. And that's true even if you're not depressed. So even if you don't have any depression, you're just having hot flushes, you still will get some relief 60% of the time. Um, unfortunately, they have risks. Nausea, dry mouth, uh, fatigue. The biggest concern is actually sexual dysfunction. Uh, they inhibit sexual desire for some women, interfere with orgasm for other women. So it kind of depends. But again, that gets into that leap of faith for risks and benefits. Most women tolerate antidepressants just fine. Some women don't. Gabapentin is the next one. Gabapentin is actually a seizure medication. We use it in a lot of different other things, chronic pain, a bunch of other stuff. It works about 60% of the time. I'm going to say that a lot. Um, some people feel tired or sluggish. The biggest thing that happens with gabapentin is actually some diarrhea, GI cramping. And gabapentin is one of those medications that you got to start slow and build up slowly. You can't just sort of jump to full treatment right away. Um, you'll be pretty miserable. So, but it definitely is an option for some women. Clonidine is a blood pressure medication. We have no idea how clonidine works to prevent hot flushes, but it does. Um, probably for about half of women who take it. Uh, it can cause dizziness or fatigue. Um, it can also cause problems sleeping, which is really counterproductive in menopause. But for some women, it works fantastic. The problem is it is a blood pressure medication. So if you're on blood pressure medications, it can really interfere with your other blood pressure medications. It can lower your blood pressure. So we generally say take it at night to reduce that. But some people can't handle the blood pressure drop. So those are the things that are better than placebo. And then there are Three things that we're going to talk about that we just really don't know if they're better than placebo or not. They may, they may not be. We just don't have quite so much information on them. Soy products is the first one. Now, soy is really confusing. There is a ton of studies on soy products in menopause, and the results are all over the place. Some of them say it helps. Some of them say it doesn't. Really very, the literature, the evidence is really confusing for us. Um, so we're just not sure what to do with it. When we kind of group things together, it seems like eating a soy-rich diet helps more than taking supplements. So eating tofu, eating edamame, eating soy products is better than just supplements. Um, fortunately, soy is pretty safe. Uh, so it's not so bad to take it. So it's definitely, for some women, worth a try in the beginning. The next one is acupuncture. Um, acupuncture has two really good studies that show it is better than placebo when combined with other things, hormones, clonidine, and antidepressants. We don't know if on its own it's gonna be better. That study hasn't been done, but it certainly, as an addition to other things, seems to improve outcomes, make hot flushes better. Also a really safe alternative. 
Um, the last one is probably the most controversial, um, black cohosh. We don't like to talk about it because it's very, very hard. But again, a bunch of studies, conflicting results. Some say it's the best thing ever. Some say it doesn't work at all. Um, so it's really, we really don't know where to go with it. Um, we don't know if it's because doses are different, people are different, um, or what really is going on with that. Um, black cohosh does have one risk, um, and it can actually cause significant liver disease. Uh, so if you're taking it or you're thinking about taking it, you really need to um, have your liver functions tested by your physician. Um, there's nothing wrong with trying it as long as you understand that you're taking a small risk and get yourself tested first. And then we're going to talk about three things that just don't seem to work. The evidence is against them. They don't seem to work. Uh, ginseng is one of those things. It doesn't seem to help hot flushes at all. Um, it does seem to help mood and sleep. So it might be worth taking for those reasons, but not necessarily for your hot flushes. Um, Dong Kwai is a Chinese herbal medication that whether we combine it with other things or leave it alone, it doesn't actually seem to do any good. Um, it also has a liver risk. Um, so it can actually injure your liver as well. So that one is a little bit concerning for, for us because it doesn't seem to help. And kava, which is actually a Polynesian um, herbal, uh, doesn't seem to help either. Uh, if anyone here has ever taken kava in uh, the liquid form, um, I can attest to the fact that it tastes like dirt and it will make your mouth numb. Um, but it doesn't help your hot flushes at all. Uh, and then the next thing we're going to talk about, the dry cracked riverbed. Um, so one of the biggest issues for menopause is really sexual dysfunction. A lot of people tolerate the hot flushes. Um, they live with all these other things. But boy, they would like to have sex again. That would be awesome. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about some things that we're treating for sexual dysfunction. Testosterone, um, like Dr. Pendergrass said, the ovary makes testosterone for about 10 years after menopause. It makes a little bit. Um, that doesn't seem to help every woman in terms of sexual function. In addition, it ends at some point. Um, and so testosterone has been studied a lot um, for sexual function. And the studies aren't quite clear. And we think that's probably because different doses have been used in studies, different uh, Populations have been used. Women are going to be different. Some women are going to require more testosterone than other women. Um, but overall, when we take them together, it seems that testosterone, taking testosterone, helps most women with sexual dysfunction. And some of that is helping in increased libido, sexual desire, and some of it's helping in um, ability to have an orgasm. Uh, unfortunately, testosterone has risks. I'm going to sound like a little bit of a broken record that everything has risks. Um, acne. Uh, male pattern hair growth, so facial hair, body hair, um, clitoral enlargement um, can happen. That's a plus minus whether people think that's good or bad, but <laughs> but it can happen. Voice deepening if uh, you take too much of it. The other thing about testosterone is it can actually raise your cholesterol and raise your heart disease risk. Um, and there's actually a really interesting study that just came out that men taking testosterone increase their heart risk, and women aren't going to be significantly probably different than that. So testosterone, risks and benefits, may be worth it, may not be. Um, and then two medications that are commonly given by naturopaths, um, DHEA as an oxytocin. Um, and these um, are supplements slash medications. I, I, we don't know. They're usually marketed as supplements. Um, but uh, there isn't a lot of evidence on them. We have a little bit of evidence on the DHEAS, um, and we're not quite sure if it works or not. Again, they're kind of back and forth um, about whether or not it works. We have hardly any information on oxytocin about any part of it. Um, and part of a, a physician, at least from my perspective, my reluctance to use it is I don't know what a safe dose is. I don't know what risks and benefits to tell you about. I don't know what risks you'd be taking taking it. Um, and I don't know, you know what to worry about, what not to worry about it with it. So it's a little bit concerning. I think there are people who are actively looking into those things as, as alternatives. But right now, we just don't know. Uh, so benefits are decidedly unclear. And then lastly, uh, I'm supposed to talk about vaginal dryness and atrophy, which is nobody's favorite, really. And, and really, the, the thing that gets everybody worked up because it doesn't go away, and it really generally gets worse. So over-the-counter stuff. We're going to start with moisturizers. Um, you're going to see these advertised on TV as replacing your natural moisture. Um, They're water-based. They can be used as a lubricant for sex, but they are designed to cling to the vaginal walls and replace some moisture that normally is there. And for some women who have mild atrophy, it works fantastic. 
You use it two, three times a week. You can use it just when you have intercourse, and it actually helps people quite a bit. Um, and actually, we'll talk about this in a minute, but there's some in the back to try if you'd like. Not try on your hands. Don't, don't go getting undressed here. There are windows. We'll get in trouble. Um, the other is lubricants. I, I, I have a personal belief that pretty much anyone over 40 should have lubricant in their house. I, I just think it's, it's, there's no harm in it at all. There are dozens of types of lubricants. There are oil-based ones, water-based ones, and silicone-based ones. Um, silicone-based ones tend to be better for postmenopausal women because the slickness actually lasts longer, um, and sometimes we need that longer sli slickness. Um, so they, but they work great. And actually, there are places where you can actually just feel the lubricants. I've got some back there too, um, to see what they feel like before you buy, spend 20 bucks on a bottle of lubricant. Um, but a huge, huge benefit for a lot of women who only have discomfort when they have intercourse that seems to help quite a bit. Um, we are, uh, a couple of notes about lubricants. Oil-based lubricants you don't use with condoms because they break them down. And silicone-based lubricants you don't use with silicone-based sex toys because it breaks them down. Um, but other than that, you're all good. We are actually super, super uh, fortunate in Portland. We actually have a female-friendly sex shop. And they didn't pay me to do this plug, but uh, they should be. <laughs> Um, we, SheBob is up in North Portland and it actually is a female friendly shop. It is run by women for women essentially. And yes, it has everything in there, but they actually have a whole big display of lubricants that you can try and feel and moisturizers that you can try and feel beforehand, um, to go see. Um, and so I strongly recommend that everybody have a favorite lubricant. Um, but there are other things for vaginal dryness and atrophy. Um, Dr. Sam Miguel mentioned vaginal estrogens, just a little bit of a discussion of, of that. Uh, like she said, there's actually very little absorption of the estrogen past the vagina. And that's actually really important because it avoids a lot of the risks that we worry about with estrogen in terms of uterine cancer and breast cancer and heart attack and stroke. They're actually, the best studies show that it doesn't seem to affect those things. Um, so vaginal estrogen is a great option for people who, the lubricants, the moisturizers, they're great, but they're just not doing it. Um, really good option. Some women notice an increase in vaginal discharge. That's not unusual because you're rejuvenating those tissues. And so you're going to have some discharge like you did when you were 30. Um, not the worst thing in the world, but some people are really bothered by it. They also improve bladder function uh, because like Dr. Pendergrass said, the urethra is affected as well. Some people have improvement in urinary leakage and improvement in less UTIs and things like that. So it's not such a bad thing. Um, so that's a good thing. They come I swear, in any possible way you can imagine, rings and pills and creams and ointments and suppositories and all sorts of things that you can put in your vagina to get the estrogen in there. <laughs> You'll notice that gynecologists use the vagina a lot. <laughs> uh, the last thing I want to talk to you about, I know this is a ton of information and it's really just supposed to prompt your discussion with your doctor, really, but uh, the last thing I want to talk to you about is CIRMS. Um, CIRMS is our selective estrogen receptor modules. So you have estrogen receptors all throughout your body, like we, Dr. Pendergrass talked about, in your bone, in your breast, in your uterus, in your vagina. And CIRMS work like an estrogen in some of those tissues and an anti-estrogen in other tissues. Um, and so they work, the particular one for vaginal atrophy, works like an estrogen in the vagina, but works like an anti-estrogen in the breast. And that's super important for women who've had breast cancer. Women who've had breast cancer are often told you should never, ever, ever, ever use an estrogen or a progesterone. Please don't. You're going to be increasing your risk of, of um, breast cancer recurrence. Um, and this CIRM, Osiphine, um, actually goes around that by being an anti and protect, protective of breast cancer. Um, so it actually gives us some, some options for people who've had breast cancer, which is awesome. This is our goal, is that it, it's your body. Um, you know it best, um, and that you really should become the genius of your own body um, and explore all your options. Thank you.